Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Thursday, May 25th, 2023. It's four o'clock in the afternoon here in Zurich, Switzerland, and the same time in Rome, Italy, uh, from which our esteemed and most valued friend, uh, Alistair Crook, joins us now. Alistair, it's a pleasure to be in the same time zone with you. We're not really that far apart geographically. Thank you very much for accommodating my schedule and joining us. There's a huge number of people lining up, uh, waiting to hear what you uh, what you have to say. Um, let's, before we get to Ukraine, let's talk about some bigger uh, issues and start with the G7. Uh, if I had to describe my impression of the G7 that just finished meeting, including with the Prime Minister of Italy, uh, in uh, in Hiroshima, Japan, it wouldn't be diplomacy, it would be bellicosity. Would you agree with my choice of that word? I think it, I think it had a, 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 the, the subtext to it, apart from being, if you like, setting up a sort of battle space for narratives, um, was really um, to set narratives. And, and so we had narratives set in all the areas, some trade and commerce and everything that were essentially anti-Chinese. It was an exercise in setting up, you know, a complex narrative, changing the language from decoupling with China to de-risking with China. It's only a disguise. It's the same thing that is coming uh, in a sense. Um, but really the importance of this is because most, most of the rest of the world don't see that China is a real threat to the United States, that it's an antagonist of the United States. They actually see that the problems that the U.S. has do not come stem from China or even Russia, but are basically internal problems, if you like, um, um, uh, basic say, structural problems within the United States. This is the threat to the United States, the internal threat is the real threat rather than China. And that's understood by in the Pacific region and elsewhere. Uh, what, what was the American goal with respect to China? Let's take Italy, country in which you're living at the, at the present time, as an example. What did Joe Biden and, and his acolytes attempt to accomplish with the new Italian prime minister? I don't think they succeeded in getting any arms out of her, but what, what was their overall goal, say, with respect to China? Well, there's always been a close connection but with China, particularly in the north of Italy. And uh, Italy was the first country in Europe that signed up to the Belt and Road Initiative. And this is basically from Turin and in the, in, in the north. And the main aim is to stop that and to block it. It's part of the setting of the scene for Europe to move towards, if you like, a, a, a sanction framework against um, China. They're not calling it at that at the moment. That's why the, the narratives were so important, like calling it de-risking rather than actual decoupling from, from China. But essentially, the United States is pivoting to China. And of course, it wants Europe to go along with it. But Europeans have reservations. So there's a lot of pressure on them now um, to go along with it. Slowly, slowly. So the Americans talk about a thaw. Biden said, I mean, rather, <laughs> it was rather paradoxically said, I expect a thaw. Just after the Chinese had, had complained that this was a, a, an exercise in slandering China and smearing the country, he said, oh, but I think there's going to be a thaw coming. I mean, all of that is about trying to prepare the ground for the Europeans to go along with the program to say, look, it's not that bad. It won't be. It'll be all right. But in fact, um, it, it, it's all about preparing the ground for pulling the Europeans more into an anti-Chinese soft posture. Well, if if the Belt and Road Initiative, basically an, an, an easing of uh, trade between uh, the two countries is going to benefit the Italian economy, which can certainly use that kind of benefit, A, what does the American government care? And B, why would the Italian government care what the American government cares about the Italian relationship to China? Is this all American hubris, American exceptionalism all over again? We're going to tell everybody else how to live? Yeah. Uh, essentially, it is wanting that the, that the Europeans 
you know, have got to line up. They've got to be uh, in, you know, on side. They've got to take the narrative. They go with the narrative, no derogation from the narrative. They've got to stay with it. And they're going to say this is a unified Western position against China, and therefore it must be right and valid that all the states are, are opposed to it. But of course, for Europe, it's uh, it's a disaster because uh, its business model was based on cheap energy from Russia and the sale of more advanced goods, uh, manufactured goods, high tech, high end engineering goods to China. And if both of those are going and they're starting to slip, like chips are now being stopped. Uh, Netherlands was producing high end chips. All of that has been stopped on the grounds that that is benefiting China. Let me stick with Italy for just a moment. Uh, President uh, Putin famously, with a little bit of sarcasm, but a lot of truth, uh, referred about two months ago uh, to the U.S. still occupying Germany, as, of course, it famously or infamously did uh, in the years immediately following uh, World War II. I wonder if he would say the same thing about the U.S. occupying Italy. Here it is telling the Italian government with whom it can trade, there are 100 American military installations, 100 on the Italian uh, peninsula, including one of which has nuclear weapons. Yes. I'm sure Mr. That's Putin right. knows all this. And all the drones that were uh, sort of ho hovering around Ukraine come from Sicily in the south of Italy, the big base, the American base there is where all of the drones, the surveillance drones go um, to harass um, Russia um, around the Black Sea. Um, so yes, it's like that very much. It is very controlled. I mean, and it was from the end of the war because um, the Americans were particularly worried that Italy might slide across to more communist um, posture. Um, so they intervened very obviously and still do intervene. How badly uh, has the U.S. and uh, Western sanctions on Russia failed to damage the Russian economy? Completely. There's, I mean, there's just one simple answer to that. Um, it's completely failed. Um, uh, Russia is a, one of the few economies that is going to show some growth, not a lot of growth, but it's going to show some growth. It has very little debt. Um, its economy is doing okay. Its inflation is almost zero, down to very little, whereas we have an inflation, food inflation at you know, 20% in Europe. Uh, it's, it, it's growing, it's expanding, it's selling its energy, its gas, and its oil comfortably to new customers in the East. And I have to say to this, and I, I speak, I mean, with a little authority on this, is that I think that the Europeans may have a nasty shock if they think at some point they'll go back to Russia and say, oh, well, now that Ukraine is over, can we have our energy back? Because the answer will be, I'm very sorry. It's now sold elsewhere, you won't have any. And, and I'm pretty sure that's what's going to happen. I don't think it's going to come back to Europe. It's a major disaster. I mean, Russia was expected to have collapsed by now, or at least to have been in a deep recession. Uh, it's you look terrible. at the mornings uh, or the day's papers, as I know you do, and the websites, the news out of Germany is Germany's in a recession. Of course. And did you see a peep in any of those articles? Now, I only read the articles in English. I know you're multi-linguistic. Uh, uh, but did you see a peep in any of those articles about the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline? Nothing, nothing. It's just vanished from the the media. But they also there's nothing about you. Never see any questions when you are when people when the newspapers talk about inflation. It's Putin's inflation. It's not the fact that Europe chose to sanction Russia, chose to forego Russian energy. It wasn't required to. It did that because it thought it would hurt Russia more badly by avoiding the sales of its energy to, to Italy and to Europe. So it imposed its ban on itself. And now we don't have it. And what I can say, I think reasonably authoritatively, is that if they turn around and ask for it back, it's not going to be available to them. Mm. What is Germany using uh, to replace 
its steady, welcomed stream of inexpensive energy that used to flow through the pipeline until the CIA and the American Navy uh, destroyed it. Uh, they're replacing it with liquefied natural gas when they can get it at about seven or eight times the cost of the pipeline gas that they were getting from, from Russia. So a huge increase in the cost. And many, many small, there was an article just recently in the German press about how many small companies are finally deciding that they're no longer competitive and they're going out of business. But the bigger companies are doing something different. They're either moving their industrial production to the United States or to China in the hope of getting a, a more competitive base from which to operate. Um, moving closer to uh, Ukraine, were you surprised uh, when uh, President Biden changed his mind uh, on uh, providing uh, F-16 jet fighters? These, of oh. course, were manufactured in the United States, sold with American government uh, permission to foreign countries on the condition that the foreign countries couldn't give them away or resell them without American permission. The American government has now given permission to those countries, Germany among them, to uh, send the fighter jets uh, to Ukraine. Before we get into whether or not this is futile, were you surprised that President Biden changed his mind? No, I think it was, uh, I think we've all seen it coming. We were expecting that to come. Uh, I wasn't surprised by that. I was a little bit more surprised that no one in Europe stood up and said, please, no, thank you. Because what this means, I mean, apart from, you know, the futility, but quite what it means is, um, as I think one of your contributors, um, Colonel Davis has pointed out, there will be none of these jets reaching <laughs> none of these fighters reading UK this year. They'll take a year to get there, which means that the war has been extended casually. A chance, to, oh yeah, okay, we'll do give them you know 40 or 50 of these jets. But what it does is it takes us down another step of escalation. It takes mm. us to closer and closer to forever war in Russia, which some people, not everyone, and there's a lot strong lobby against it in the United States, I know, but there are strong forces that would like to see this turn into a forever war, a sort of quagmire on Russia's doorstep that will drain it of resources and be a festering wound for years to come. So, uh, I, I mean, I don't think this is going to happen because Russia is not going to let it happen. Here's uh, President Biden about 13 months ago commenting on the dangers of sending, I think he says tanks, trains, and planes. I don't know what he meant by trains, but that was the language he used. The key phrase or the last three words of what he says. War against Ukraine was never be a victory. Democrats are rising to meet the moment, relying, r rallying the world on the side of peace and security. We're showing the strength and we'll never falter. But look, the idea the idea that we're going to send in offensive equipment and have planes and tanks and trains uh, going in with American pilots and American crews, just understand, and uh, don't kid yourself, no matter what you all say, that's called World War III, okay? So now he's come 100 and 180 degrees from that. It's not based on intelligence reports. We know that from our intel uh, folks. Uh, it's certainly not based on reports from the ground. We know that from the secret documents that were uh, revealed showing the government uh, knows that Ukraine is losing. It must just be purely politics. This neocon urge to continue a fruitless, without an off-ramp war against Russia. I think there's another aspect which was so apparent during the G7, which is we are not losing this absolute insistence on saying, no, you know, whatever you see, Bakhmut, whatever it is, we're winning. Uh, we are stuck on this sort of hubristic, if you like, delusion that must be sustained. So I think, you know, uh, as um, Bakhmut um, completely fell um, to Russian uh, troops, to the Wagner troops, um, 
there had to be something to show we were not losing. We're still winning. And so he made this gesture. Of course, it probably won't be Americans in the, in, in the cockpit. I don't know who it will be. Um, but, and also it will be, as you rightly said, it won't, won't change anything in, 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 in the war at all, except it will extend it. And mm. it will uh, 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 also increase the war. It will be another stage in the process. And at the same time, we've just had, um, I think it was um, either Sullivan or Blinken, I'm not sure quite which of them, but repeating, and they've said it before, of course you're allowed to fire long-range missiles at um, Crimea. Of course that's all right, because that's part of Ukraine. We have no problems with that. All of these are taking us closer to closer. And, and why I take this so seriously in the G7 outcome of this is that really it means that the West, and particularly the European Union, is incapable of providing a political solution for Ukraine. Their present solutions are pie in the sky, which means just simply accepting uh, Zelensky's terms, and that without a solution, what can Russia do? It has one choice, which is to go all the way. It'll go as far, first of all, halfway, and see again if the West is prepared to take things seriously and accept the Russian terms. If it doesn't, well then, you know, we're going to see more bloodshed and it extend um, even further. But they are creating the circumstances that push Russia into this position. As, as bellicose as uh, President Biden has been and the G7 has been, do you have reason to believe that the Americans have been whispering into a Zelensky's ear in Hiroshima and elsewhere it's time to sit down and talk. It's time to have serious negotiation. And Zelensky has enough, I'll use your word, hubris, to say to his masters and suppliers, no. You know, there are, I mean, we've, uh, Cy Hirsch, uh, who I know quite well, I mean, who has, has said something along these lines. And we certainly see the division in the United States and that there are those that are saying that. And most importantly, because it's often used as a vehicle for messaging, the Financial Times came out last week saying very clearly that American sources say that the war has got to end very soon, otherwise it won't be possible to continue the support. By September, they said. That's the time limit. By September. And then, quite casually, um, Biden gives the green light to, to F-16s, which immediately implies September's finish. It, it's right, going to go right. on for to the end of the year at least if he goes through with it. And the Europeans, to my uh, surprise and um, disappointment, uh, just grabbed it and said, oh, this is great, let's do this, because they are just so beholden. They just don't seem to be able to say no to the United States. It's just remarkable. They say they want an early end to this war. And what do they do about it? Nothing except Nothing. proposed ideas like a frozen conflict, which is a non-starter, because they are d d still in this delusion. We're not losing. We're winning. Uh, we can't allow our narrative to be weakened in any way because it's the only narrative. This is the narrative that must fit and has got to fit for the global world. The global, um, the world order, the new world order has to be the only paradigm, the only reality for the rest of the world. And of course, there's a whole stampede going on. I mean, we had it just the previous week, the week earlier, when we had the Arab League, which went multipolar, completely went multipolar last right. week, and um, brought and uh, the arrival of Assad was not his reincorporation in the Arab League. It was a symbol of the change by the Arab League towards a multipolar world, which was much more important. And it was an act of iconoclasm against the, um, the Western hegemony. And this is the same elsewhere. In Africa, you're getting the same. There is a tide sweeping, and it just doesn't penetrate through to our leaderships. They don't see it because it's become so easy just to stay on narrative. They've got the mainstream media repeating the narrative endlessly. When you have that, you don't have to argue a case. You don't have to think very carefully. And it doesn't matter if you lie or if you exaggerate 
because the mainstream media will just cover it up or, mm. or give it support. So they don't think, and therefore there's no, you know, they don't even think about a solution, even though it is important to them. So I think a couple, it's a coming disaster. A couple of more uh, topics. I know uh, Turkey is about to endure round two of its presidential elections, but is Turkey in hot water with the rest of NATO for either cozying up too close to President Putin or actually selling military equipment to him? You know, uh, Turkey's always in hot water with with NATO, one way or another. Um, and uh, but Turkey, you know, it's it's the largest, it's the largest armed force um, in in the whole region, um, and it has air bases. Its geo geo strategic positioning is so important that you know, even though the NATO people grind their teeth. I mean, they can't get rid of uh, they can't get rid of Turkey. There's no provision in NATO for sacking someone for for these uh, elements, and I don't think um, Erdogan has any interest in really leaving NATO. It's quite a useful foil for him. It's a useful, uh, if you like, lever he can play in his very complex um, maneuvers of, of geopolitics, and he is a great maneuverer in in geopolitics. Going from um, a large country to a small one, uh, we are hearing in, in the West, although, of course, I'm in Europe this mm. week, of uh, rumors of a coup in Belarus uh, by the Belarus military, which, of course, will be uh, supported by the Polish military and opposed by Russia. Here we go again, the Poles with their itchy trigger fingers. Do you hear this? I've seen the I've seen the story, but I can't tell you that there's really any any truth. I what I don't see is I haven't seen any sort of very strong Russian reaction. I mean, you remember before when there was a, a threatened coup. I mean, it was at midnight the Russians sent forces and airplanes and secured the whole area just like that. It just happened. I mean, it was an extraordinary rapid deployment, which would make NATO quite green with envy. I mean, it just happened and went very rapidly. I think if we see that sort of thing happening, if we see a deployment of, of Russia, and because there's a sort of very close security arrangement between Russia and Belarus now. And so right. I think, it, I mean, when we see something taking, planes taking off or forces deploying, there are already about 50,000, I think, Russian forces inside Belarus. Um, but uh, if we see more of that, then we should take it more seriously. But at the moment, I haven't seen that. I mean, of course, all around the area in the in the what I call the stands, the the you know Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and all of those, are big efforts by America to 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 try and produce uh, a reaction and to block the the Belt and Road. I mean, they have embassies with five hundred. 800 staff in places like Tajikistan or Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan, huge embassies there. But the but those states, I mean, you know, I think it's just the obvious um, geopolitics. You have Russia on one side and you have China on another side. Where are you going to position yourself? Right. Uh, Alistair, always a pleasure, my dear friend. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you from the States. I will be in the States uh, early next week. Enjoy Thank you. Thanks for joining us. More as we get it, my friends. Judge Napolitano for judging freedom.